Hello, I'm Mike Hayes, editor of Construction Europe magazine. Earlier today, I was talking to Adam Box, business development manager for Topcon Positioning Systems, a company which, among other things, uh, produces technology for geopositioning and for construction. And we were talking about innovations from the company, but also generally about the acceleration of the use of technology in construction brought about largely by the COVID-19 crisis. So Adam, it, it's good to talk to you again. Uh, it, it was Intergeo last year when we when we last chatted, and I know a lot has changed since then, not not all for the better. Yeah. Um, but um, but there's been a lot of talk recently about uh, about the pandemic causing a, an acceleration of the digital transformation of construction, as people are, uh, are calling it. Do you do you think that's actually happening, or is that just paper talk? Um, I think it'll take time to happen, but I think there's, there's absolutely no doubt that people are, are now finally reassessing how they're delivering projects in in the full widest context. Because obviously, there's a big challenge at the moment, which is people on site. And you know, at the end of the day, businesses need to survive, and they often need triggers to make serious changes. And although there are there are massive negative connotations to COVID, and we all know what they are. It is obviously acting as a trigger for some businesses to to reevaluate what they're doing, you know, to to remove some of the old ways that they worked because there was no real need to change. You know, they just carry on doing the same stuff, making the same errors, you know, all those sort of bits and pieces. And now, of course, you know, you can see that we're going to be faced with a, a raft of very, very different requirements to deliver projects. One of them is to continue to deliver them without having lots of staff. You know, try and deliver them more efficiently because that's going to be pretty critical. So I think, yes, we are seeing a reach for, you know, not going to call them new ways because they've been around a way, but, you know, for an evolution in that in that delivery process. And, you know, you know, myself, it, it's been something I've been hammering away at for an awfully long time. I mean, this is not we're not saying, you know, we're asking you to sort of make a great leap of faith. It's actually these tools have been around for a while. Perhaps this is the time they become mature and accepted rather than be seen as something that, oh, no, no, no well, yeah, next time. You know, now we are seeing that. So, yeah, it, it's, yeah, I don't even call it a positive for COVID. I don't think it's the right thing to say, but it could be an outcome. You know, the same as when you look at uptake of electric vehicles and things like that. You can see that, the, you know, we've got this transition phase going on and, you know, everyone says, oh, will we flip back to where we are? That could take a long time to get back to a, a 2019 situation in, in you know, our consumption of things and things we do. So, yeah, I think I think we've got a change going on. Yeah, and obviously, you know, we've got the the European Green Deal now. Um, contractors are are having to think about building more energy efficient buildings, um, less waste in in the the structures that they build, and less carbon emissions yep. um so are, are we at a point now where there's really little choice but to go down this technological route it never mind to to boost efficiency just to get back to the efficiency that we need with with fewer people on site etc yeah i mean i've kept thinking that for a long time i mean one of the things that's baffled me for uh, quite a long time and and you know when you're in the sort of technology space and you're used to adopting it is is why there's always been this massive negative pressure to reach for things that just seem so obviously efficient um so yeah I, I think we are going to see that happening more and more as people not forced but i think the logical thing is to embrace what's now available to deliver against stuff that has to happen i mean whether it's carbon whether it's just just pure economics just pure can i make a profit this year when you look at the 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 problems and the delays and the errors that are endemic in construction today you know if you were any other business you wouldn't have survived but yet for somehow construction clings on to minuscule profit margins you know projects that are clearly delivered badly and and they're almost allowed to get away with it um, it's probably a little bit confrontational, but you know, it, you sort of see this happening where it just seems it seems utterly baffling. You couldn't explain it when I try and talk to somebody outside the construction about what happens. They think I'm making it up because they, they go, "No, no, we're great at this," and you sort of go, well, "Yeah, we we have achieved some great things," but underneath is is often a delivery process that is quite unusual. You know, just really. <laughs> Well, every when you look at, I mean, my my favourite thing is when whenever I'm talking to somebody about 
you know, a main contractor doing the validation of have things been put in the right place. So that seems a fairly logical thing to do. And, and the number of times they tell me that the way they validate that things are correct is to ask the subcontractor who did it whether he got them right. Now, it's like, guess what the answer is? <laughs> But that's almost like, well, you know, I mean, I've contracted with this steel worker and of course he's going to do it correctly. Yeah, that's why I tell you as well. So there is a shift, I think, in the whole, you know, management of the delivery process and a recognition that perhaps if you understand that things are, it's not that you want to pick up on things going wrong, but you want to identify deviations from what you thought was going to happen to allow you to make much quicker decisions about either correcting it at the time it happens or building that into the rest of the program so that it's not a surprise later on when something doesn't work because you never realized that that was wrong. Um, yeah. so it, it's a very, very simple, understandable concept, but you know, I'm, I think it's changing. It, it's a slow process of construction, but when I look at the engagement that we're having with contractors who are, are looking to move their workflows into this environment i'm seeing more of it now which is great but you know hopefully that'll be the wave that will then continue and, and things will be done in the way that you know we're always expecting which is you know well coordinated design which we know goes on that's fine and relatively without upsetting the designers are wonderful that's a relatively easy thing to manage because it's data flow and it's coordination there's lots of tools to do that for me in construction, the problems have always been on site. That transition from the design environment to the on site and managing that. And, and that's always been the area that the main focus should be. But obviously, you know, it's easier to deal with the design space than it is on site because that's very challenging. But I'm hopeful that that flow is starting to happen. And maybe at the other end, you know, when clients actually start to say to a contractor, I want an as built model. If they just said that and said, you have to deliver me that, that would allow a contractor to say, oh, shit, I better start thinking about, you know, managing this all the way through so I can hand that over. At the moment, that's often not asked for as a, a defined, I have to have that. It's almost something that they gets weaven, woven out of a contract through various clauses that right. they sort of give them something. But yeah, the whole, the, the, the BIM and the, the digital twin stuff is, all part of that world but to me you know, just purely a contract a, a main a client saying give me an as-built model that accurately reflects what you've done that would be enough of a shift to people go we better start doing this and and guess right. what you know we're sat there with with workflows to help them do it and not stuff that we invented things that we know do it you know i've got a contractor over in germany that actually won't tell anybody how he's using our solutions because he sees it as a massive competitive advantage i've seen what he's doing and it's hugely impressive you know right. he, he's effectively giving himself a live as built model every day right built into the delivery process okay now you know you think about the value of that in just pure pounds and pence or euros, whatever it happens to be, having effectively a live as built model, every, knowing exactly how things are being installed, how you're performing against the program, how deviations are being captured and, and, and understood and actioned on. You know, that, that seems to me such an obvious area that you could make huge financial gains on a project. But there's very few people doing that. You know, there's lots of people trying to explore how they bring it in, you know, through using, using photogrammetry or drones and all this sort of stuff. But the challenge has always been that to get live as built information on the site to the accuracy they need at the moment, you have to static scan. You know, right. You know, yes, there's mobile, everything else. But realistically, as it stands today, you've got a static scan. And that means that you've got to come up with a workflow that means that that flow of, of capturing is, is as quick as you can make it and also as efficient. You don't want to have separate teams coming on. We can't do that anymore. It's got to be you know, either utilizing teams or people already there and giving them extra capability. And, and that's where you know, my, my workflow comes from. And you know, for me, it seems so straightforward, so obvious, but it always is when you're trying to sell stuff to people who you know, have other challenges. Uh, but yeah. Well, I, I I want to come back to this that workflow process mm. of yours 
Um, but first, I think I want to go back a little bit. Um, could you tell me how and when and why Topcon created its its vertical construction division? What was the thinking behind that? That's pre-pandemic. <laughs> it, it is, yeah, and um, yeah, it was part of. So when I joined, I was wrapped up in that look, that review of of something that I think I've seen coming for a while, and it's the change in in what they call them professions. So it's the change in the utilization of the professions. And the profession that I think is under enormous pressure at the moment is surveying. It's moving from a proprietary, difficult, traditional professional environment, and it's been democratized. Mm. So I'm not saying it will go away. It'll always be needed. You'll always need to have that high end uh, requirement, but it's being democratized and it's shifting down into the, the delivery space. It, it into people actually get on site and do stuff. They're starting to do the things that you know traditionally would never have happened. That would have been the role of a very specialized individual, you know, capturing the world around them accurately, staking out accurately. So in order to follow that, and to be relevant to it, that's where vertical construction really became a focus as we wanted to see and make sure that we were relevant to these, these growing requirements of subcontractors, main contractors, tradespeople in a way that they would understand. Because you can't talk to them as a surveying environment because they don't understand that world. It's immediately confusing and irrelevant to them. You've yeah. got to you know, find a way of being able to talk about things that they already do. And, and for the VC thing is a big push into that space, which is why you see us being terribly open with what we do. So, and I'm don't talk about open in terms of telling people we obviously do that, but in terms of integration into existing processes that are, are already in place. Because I don't want to come to you as as a you know, subcontractor or main contractor and say, look, I've got this amazing thing you can do. All you've got to do is change everything that you do today, and then you'll be able to take advantage of it. Because you'll tell me straight away, I can't do that. But if I say, do you know what, I've got something that you can slot into the way that you work at the moment, that enhances it and allows you to then develop, that's slightly more interesting. And we could only do that by having a VC focus, where we looked at that industry sector, discovered the language that they use, discovered the challenges that they've really got and the processes they're currently using, and how do we fit into that? Not come to them from a, you know, a different um, professional background and say, look, we've got these tools, they'll be great for you because they wouldn't, it doesn't mean anything to them. Yeah. So it's when you look at the sort of su the sweep that we've got from, you know, the, the simpler layout solutions that we have with an app that's on a phone, you know, a, a very accessible, I suppose in the old term, robotic total station through the whole sweep of, you know, more more powerful and accurate total stations through to the scanners. And of course, you know, my favorite toy at the moment or, or, or product is the GTL, which is the merge of the two. Where again, the workflow just works. I mean, you remember my demonstration where I talk about how difficult it is to use it. You know, you press two buttons and and that, that's quite revolutionary because what we've done there is we've taken somebody that's come from a site engineering background that understands how to resection a toll station and we've turned them into a scanner, a scanner man. And traditionally, those would have been seen as very separate entities, very different cost points. Um, you know, scanning, if you talk to contractors, is something that they've sort of dabbled with. And they say, oh, yeah, the team came and they were there two days and a few weeks later, they gave me some data. You know, that, that's not a good place. You've got to be doing it all the time. So, yeah, that's what we did was to deliver a workflow into that site engineer who could evolve from something he does all the time, setting up a total station and doing his QA and everything else, resetting into control to being a scanner and being able to do real time verification. So into Geo, and I know you didn't look at my presentation, I don't blame you for it. Um, I did. A, I showed a, a video that I'd done for the first time and I might broadcast it more widely, but it's a speed run of processing the data to creating the verity results. So in other words, how quickly could you do it? And it wasn't even a particularly fast speed run, but it's 24 minutes. So it's 24 minutes from somebody coming off a site with an SD card in their hand and having verity results. In other words, having information that they can then action on. You know, have what I've just seen was it accurate? And if it's not, where's the deviations? So although, you know, the Americans talk about, you know, it's real time verification. I do near real time because it's, 
you know, I'm not quite that enthusiastic, but there is a delay, but it's, it's, you know, it's as short as possible, but it does mean, and we learned this from our customers, that they began to do this every day. And yeah. when you ask them why, they, they turn around and say, why not? Because it means that, you know, I'm on top of the changes and the, the program that's happening on site. I can see what's going on. And if there are deviations, I know about them and I can make a decision. Yeah. And it's not to go and shout at the subcontractor. It might be that we recognize the deviation occur. We know it now. What do we do about it? Do I change the design? Do I change the program? You know, do I update my models to then reclash? I mean, that's the most powerful thing of real time verification is the fact that you can run the clash detection again on the updated model information and say, if we accept that this is going to be where it is, what does it hit? What yeah. else does it interfere with? Yeah. You don't right then. You don't do it three months later when the guy goes to install and it's not. Why doesn't it fit? You've already done it three months before and made that that change in design, delivery, or whatever else. So those sort of things for me, are, you know, they, they, they've been around for a while, and I, I hope that you know what comes out of this is a recognition that these efficiencies have got to be delivered into construction sites. You know, you've got to make better use of personnel, elevate their capability, which we do. It's got to be quick and easy to do, which you know, I'm biased, but I think it's a relatively straightforward process. Uh, and it's got to help them deliver on the promise of BIM and digital twin and the need, as I said at the beginning, just if you said, just give me an as built model that truly yeah. reflects what you've actually built. And then you know, these pieces are in place now. And you were talking there about like integrating this technology into the process. And yeah. and you are now working with with the likes of Bentley and Autodesk. How did that come about? I mean, what's what's different about their tech? What did you want that, that you didn't have? And how do you work together? So we're delivering different things. You know, in the old days, as you know, as I started out in technology, you'd bring out a new piece of technology that stood alone would improve a customer's ability. Whether for me, it was, I mean, going way back when, digitization, print processing, um, bringing 3D CAD, to the, the 2D CAD environment. These were individual things that, that delivered immediate benefit. The problem we've got now is that I think those days have sort of gone. What we've now not are individual bits of, of technology that have to fit into the current processes that are in place because we're all elevated. You know, we're not we're not taking a drawing board into 2D CAD anymore. You know, that's just sitting there. The technology is so much greater. Those processes exist. So from our side, you know, we have to think about if you were a customer, how do you make it as easy as possible for you to take advantage of what we've got and fit it into your existing workflows? And because of that, you know, you're going to be a MicroStation user or a, an Autodesk user. What do we do to make it easy to, to reach for positioning and surveying type activities within the environment you're in? So, yeah, that, that's the integration with them. Um, some of it is historic, uh, particularly with Autodesk. You know, that's been a long time relationship with them. Um, going back to when I think we co-bought an organization that turned into point layout. So there's always been a good relationship on the development side. But often people are surprised just how how open and integrated we are. You know, we're not going to come to you as a contractor and say, dump everything, just do it our way. You know, we've made a deliberate and conscious effort to to want to fit into how you currently deliver projects with the technology you've got and what can we do to support that. Uh, but in terms of you know on the on the VC space, you know what we launched there, it was really to try and you know show people the evolution is still going on and that it's still something that's available to them. We did have a little bit additional uh, customer uh, data just to remind people that you know there are organisations doing this, which is always important. You know within construction. There are some that reach for it first, and we've been delighted with some of the work that we're doing with Balfour BT and, and Skanska in particular. I've got a session with a Digital Construction Week, another webinar, um, where we, you know, we're going to talk about you know, what was their process of, of bringing in the GTL verification workflow into a project, and what are they getting from it? And, and some of it's quite explosive in a way. You know, some of the numbers that they bandy around about the savings they've made you know, it's it's very significant and it's multiple um, the cost that they ever outlaid on, on the, the, the process. You know, it's incredible to watch them. And you sort of think, you know, you're just talking about saving, you know, more than six figures in an era that you've identified. 
and then you go and talk to another project and you sort of think does this guy not believe me you know yeah. it's, it's kind of you know <laughs> You know, we do what we do, you know, because we're you know passionate about it. And so I see they go, what? And I know I'm sales, so you're not going to blame me anyway. But honestly, this you know they're saving hundreds of thousands here, so it's kind of weird. But hopefully the process is changing. One of the selling points, I guess, for for companies like yours is that you can do a lot more with fewer people. Um, uh, you know, smaller teams, teams working remotely. Yeah. I mean that that sort of lends itself to the the new normal that that we're going to be experiencing i guess in construction um but do you think also we're going to see um contractors having to bring in teams who have more technological knowledge uh and i'm talking about people working on site now are people on site will this sort of technological know-how have to devolve down uh downstream to those actually just on the ground working on site is that is that where we're headed yeah i mean uh, being slightly confrontational, I would say it's, it's actually got to go the other way. Right. Because if you think about the people that are entering the environment, the construction space, they're actually already massively technically savvy. They've grown up with phones. They've grown up with, with all these tools readily available. I know where I am all the time. You know, I can look at any data I want whenever I want. So you, you've got these people coming in. So it's not like I've got, to me, it's almost... The people higher up have got to, they, they're the ones that got to evolve to actually get rid of the way they did it before and recognize that there's this wave of people that are trying to come into this sector that are coming from a very different background. You know, these people don't need to learn how to turn a computer on, you know, access information and all these things that need to ha used to happen in the past. They're used to it. You know, they're used to the, the access to portal type information through Facebook and in, they're used to taking photographs all the time. It, it's me. It, it's, I think it's the other way around. And that's why from our side, we're, we're really trying to look at what do we do to, to help that process happen? You know, where do we reach for? And you'll see us announce some stuff fairly soon if I can get them to do it, that demonstrate how we are reaching for the next wave of technology that's already there. They're already using it and trying to bring that through into construction. So, yeah, I, I think, yes, we're going through a technology change and I think it will happen as these, this wave comes in. And they'll they'll be sitting there going, well, why haven't I got all these tools? And hopefully, the the, the ones further up will recognise that perhaps they need to reconsider how they're delivering projects that 20 years ago worked. I mean, 20 years in, I my God, you know, think of the technology jumps that we've made from the what's in our hands, what's available to us, what we're wearing. You know, you just look at all this stuff going on. You know, what's flying around us. I mean, look at the things that we're doing in the autonomous construction machinery space. You see this, this direction of travel with technology. We might not be there today, but you think about the amount of effort being put into it. You can see that route that's going on. And Topcon's in that. You know, the things yeah. that I talk around internally is, is making sure that we're not falling behind what technology is doing, that we're helping evolve with it, take advantage of it, integrate with it, deliver it as a practical application into the site. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's what keeps me excited about where I am and what we're doing. Um, you know, we've got things that work today, but I'm also quite excited about what we're going to have for the things that need to work tomorrow and, and the future. Right. We are pushing fairly hard in that space. So we just need to let more people know, to be honest. But hence Brilliant. the call. Well, hopefully we'll talk again tomorrow then and you can tell me a bit more. <laughs> uh, that, that's That's not up to me. <laughs> <laughs> all right adam thanks very much really appreciate your time this morning thank you for that no problems at all mike always a pleasure